Hi there. I'm Jeffrey Licht, and I'm here to talk to you about the Harvard Library and building tomorrow's library today, I guess. Um, so the background here, the pitch for this session is essentially that there is a lot of bibliographic data available in the Harvard Libraries, and there is um, an opportunity for, through some of the tools and a project that's being developed, to get access to the information and um, take it to places that you know, the Harvard Library isn't doing right now, do new stuff with it, experiment and play around with it. So the uh, entry point into this is an API called Harvard, the Harvard Library Cloud. There's an open metadata server, which um, I will talk about now. So the background is that there is a lot of stuff in the Harvard Library. Um, you have over 13 million bibliographic records, millions of images and thousands of finding aids, which are essentially documents describing, describing collections, saying what is in them, um, you know, boxes of papers and so forth, that represent you know, over a million individual documents. And there's also uh, a lot of information that the library has about um, how the content is used that is, could be of interest to people who are, um, might want to work with it. So, all of the information in the library is, has metadata. So metadata um, is data about data. So when we talk about the information that's available through the library cloud that's available, it's not really, not necessarily the actual documents themselves, not necessarily the full text of um, books or the full images, though that actually may be the case. But it's really uh, information about the data. So you can think of cataloging information, call numbers, subjects, how many copies of the book there are, what are the editions, what's the, what are the formats, the authors, and so forth. So there's a lot of information about um, the information in the collection that in itself is kind of inherently useful. And um, you know, though if you're doing in-depth research, you obviously want to get to the actual content itself and find and look at the data, finding the metadata is useful in terms of both analyzing you know, the corpus as a whole, like how do all, what is the, what things are in the collection, how do they relate, um, it helps you really find other stuff, which is really the main purpose of it. The point of the metadata and the cataloging is to help you find all the information that's available within the collections. So this is an example of metadata um, for a book in the, in the Harvard Library. So it's there, and you can see it's actually moderately complex. And part of the value of metadata within the Harvard, Harvard Library system is that it's been um, sort of built up by catalogers and assembled by, by people applying a lot of expertise and skill and thought to it over time. So, which is more than, um, you know, which, is, which has a lot of value. So if you take a look at this record for um, the annotated Alice, you can find out, you know, you've got the title, um, who who wrote it, the author, and you know, all the different subjects which um, you know, people have cataloged it into. And you can see there's also, there's an addition to um, you know, a lot of good information here. There's some duplication, there, you know, there's a lot of complexity that's reflected through the metadata that you have. So you know, the title, one title of this book is Alice's Adventures in Wonderlands. And this is an annotated version of, um, of that book. But it's also called the annotated Alice, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, because it's something which Martin Gardner wrote and annotated the book, and there's a lot of great information about logic puzzles and things with analysis that you probably didn't know about, so you should go read it. But you can see there's a lot of detail here, and um, including identifiers, when it's created, where it came from in terms of the Harvard system, and so forth. So this is a sample of the type of metadata that you might see for a book in the Harvard Library Collection. Um, this is something completely different. So um, there is a, a system called VIA at Harvard, which basically is cataloging images and objects of art and um, visual, visual things throughout Harvard and um, adding some met metadata to them, classifying them, and in some cases providing um, you know, small thumbnail images that you can take a look at if you, if you so wish. So this is an example of the metadata that you have for a plate from presumably Alice in Wonderland, and you can see there's, you know, this is there's less metadata here. It's just a different kind of object, and so there's there's less information. You mostly have the fact that a call number, essentially, who created it. We don't know when it was created, um, and a title. 
Another example, this is a finding aid. So there's a collection of Lewis Carroll's papers at Harvard. So this describes um, what, what is in that collection. So someone has gone through and looked through all the boxes and uh, you know, cataloged it, given some background, written a summary of what's here. And if you were to look further at this, this goes on for pages and pages and pages, but we'll tell you, you know, what letters and what dates from what boxes existed throughout the, um, you know, in the collection. So this is something that if you're Harvard, you can go and actually physically look up and presumably take a look at. So this is all great. Um, this metadata is useful. It's in the Harvard library system. You, there are tools online where you can go and take a look at it and see it and search it and lots, you can slice and dice it in lots of different ways. But it's really only available if you are a human being sitting down at your web browser or um, something or your phone and navigating through it. It's not really available in any kind of usable fashion for, pe for other systems or other computers to use. Not with systems within the Harvard Library, but systems in the outside world, just other, other people in general. So the question is how can we make it available to um, computers so that we can you know, do more interesting stuff with it than just browsing it ourselves. So why would you want to do this? There's, um, you know, there are a lot of possibilities. One is you could build a completely different way of browsing the content that's available through the Harvard libraries. Um, I'll show you one later called Stack Life, which you know, has a completely different take on looking for content. You could build a recommendation engine. So you know, Harvard Library isn't in the business of saying, you like this book, then go take a look at these 17 other books that you might be interested in, or these 18 other uh, images. But that is certainly could be a valuable feature. And it's given the metadata, it may be possible to put that together. You might have different needs in terms of searching the content. Like may, despite the tools that are available through, you know, the library makes available, you might want to search in a different way or optimize for a particular use case, which maybe it's very specialized. Maybe there are only a few people in the world who want to search the content this way, but it would be great if we could let them do that. Um, you know, there's a lot of analytics in terms of how people use the content that would be really interesting to know about. Find what books are being used, what are not, um, and so forth. And then there's a lot of opportunity to um, integrate with other conf information that's out there on the web. So we have, you know, for example, NPR has a book review segment where they interview authors about books. And so it would be great if you were looking up a book in the, um, in the Harvard Library to say, okay, oh, there's been an interview with the author. Let's go take a, take a look at that. Or there's a Wikipedia page you know, as an authoritative, you know, scholarly reference about this book you might want to take a look at. There are, you know, these types of sources, um, you know, scattered throughout the web and bringing them together would be, you know, could be a great use to someone looking at the content, looking for something. But it's also not the kind of thing you'd want the library to be responsible for going down and hunting all these different sources and plugging them together because they're changing continuously and they're only, um, and you, what they pick, what they think is important may not be what you think is important. And even more so, basically, there's a lot of stuff we haven't thought of yet. So um, if we can open this up, more people besides you know, a half dozen or so who are looking at this on a regular basis can think of ideas and massage the data and do what they want with it. So we want to make this data available to the world. And but there are a couple of complications. One is that this metadata is in different systems. It's in different formats. Um, so there's you know, what's some normalization which needs to happen, which normalization being the process of bringing things from different formats and mapping them to a single format so that, you know, the fields will match up. There are some copyright restrictions. Oddly enough, the catalog entry about a book is liable for copyright. So even though it's just information derived from the book, it's, it's copyrightable. And depending on who actually created that metadata, there may be restrictions on who can distribute it. You know, similar to, I know, it may or may, may not be similar to the situation with the song lyrics, for example. So we all know how that pans out. So you need to get around that issue. And then another piece is that these, um, there's a lot of data. So if I am someone who wants to, you know, uh, you know, work with the data or has a cool idea, dealing with 14 million records on my laptop could be problematic and difficult, difficult to manage. So we want to reduce the barriers for people to be able to work with the data. So the approach you know, that hopefully addresses all of these concerns is, is for the two parts. One is 
building a platform that takes data from all these disparate sources and aggregates it, normalizes, enriches it, and makes it available in a single location. And it makes it available through a public API that people can call. So an API is an application programming interface. And it basically refers to um, an endpoint that a system or technology can call and get data back in a structured format in a way that it can be used. So it's not, not dependent on going to a website and scraping data off of it, for example. So this is the home page of the Library Cloud IAM API, which is essentially its version 2. So it's the second iteration of trying to make all of this data available to, um, to the world. So it's HTTP API dot lib for library, Harvard EDU, v2 slash items. And just to break this down a little bit, what this means is that this is version 2 of the API. There's a version 1, which I'm not going to talk about, but there is a version 1. And if you're calling this API, you are getting items. And part of um, the idea of an API is an API is a contract. It's something that is not going to change. So for example, and the reason is that if I build some kind of system that is going to use the Library Cloud API to um, you know, display books or you know, help people find information in unique ways, what we don't want to have happen is for us to go change how that API works, and suddenly everything breaks on, on the end user side. So part of, if you're, if you're um, making API, API available to the world, it's good practice to put a version number in it so people know what version they're dealing with. So if we decide we find a better way of making this information available, we might change that to be version, call that version 3. So everyone who's still using version 2, that'll still work. But version 3 um, is, uh, would have all the new stuff. So what this, so this is an API, but this really looks like a URL. And so what this is an example of, it's what's called a REST API, which, and it's available over just a regular web connection. And you can actually go to it in a browser. So here I'm gone to just open up Firefox and gone to api.lib.harvard.edu slash v2 slash items. And so what I get here is basically the first page of results from the entire set of items that we've got. And it's here in XML format. So I've got a, and it's also been prettified by Firefox. It doesn't actually have all these little expanding and contracting doohickeys here. Um, this is sort of a, 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 a nicer version of looking, way to look at it. But what this is telling us is I've, I've requested the, all the items. So there are um, 13,289,475 items. And I'm looking at the first 10 starting at position 0, because in computer science, we always start at, at 0. And what I have here, if I just collapse this, you'll see I've got um, 10, 10 items. Um, and if I take a look at an item, I can see that I've got information about it. And this is in what's called mods format. So I'm going to switch back here for a moment. OK. All right, so I, let's, let's, let's search for something in specific, because the first item that happens to come up when you look through the entire collection is, is you know, by definition, random. So let's look for some donuts. So. OK, so. Um, so donuts, so we found there are, eight, there are 80 items in the collection that um, reference donuts. Um, we're looking at the first 10 of them. Now you can see um, here the, the way that I said I'm looking for donuts, if I just added something to the query string of the URL, so q equals donuts, which you can see a little more easily here. And this basically means there's a spec for the API which defines what all these parameters mean, and this means we're going to search everything for donuts. So the first item here we have is, um, uh, you can see there's the title is Donuts, and there's a subtitle called An American, An American Passion, which is, I guess, appropriate. There are a lot of different, once you get to the point of getting the data, there are a lot of different formats that you can get it, in, get it into. And there are different strengths and weaknesses for all of them. So this one, you can see here, it's very, this format's very rich, and it's, it's standardized. Um, so you can, so you can, there's a specific title field, a subtitle field, there's an alternate title, an American Passion, um, there's, a, there's the um, a name associated with it, a type of the resource, it's text, a lot of information here in this format. But there are 
a bunch of different formats. So what we are just looking at is a format called MODS, which stands for Metadata Object Description Service, potentially. I'm actually not quite sure about the S. But it's a fairly complex format. It's the default format. But it's what the one that keeps the entire the richness of all the data that the library has. Because this is the format the library is very close to what the library uses internally. It's a standard that is used across, you know, across the country, across the world, in academic libraries, and it's very interoperable. So if you've got a mod or document that is in mods format, you can give that to somebody else whose systems understand mods and they can import it. So you know, it's a standard, it's very well defined, um, very specific, and that is what makes it um, interoperable because if someone says this is the alternate title of, of, a, of a record, everybody knows what that means. On the flip side, it's very complicated. So if you take a look, um, take a look at this record here. If I just want to get the title of this document, this book, which is probably Donuts and American Passion, it's you know parsing it out is a, is a, a little involved. Whereas there's another format called Dublin Core. Um, which is a much, much simpler format. So you see here, there's no title, subtitle, alternate title. There's just a title, Donuts and American Passion, and another title, American Passion. So the, when you're looking at what format you want to get the data out of, a lot depends on how you're going to use it. Are you using it for interoperability, or do you want something simple that, um, that might be easier to work with? On the flip side, a lot of the, you know, there's a lot of the details get sort of squished down. You might lose the nuances of what a particular field means. You're dealing with Dublin Core, um, which you wouldn't get with mods. So those are two of the formats you can get out of the API. And basically, we're keeping it behind the scenes in mods, but we can give you it in mods and Dublin Core and um, you know, anything else as well. The, the other consideration you're looking at the data is you can get it as either JSON, which stands for JavaScript Object Notation, or XML, which stands for extensible markup language. And these are, these data representations both have exactly the same data, exactly the same fields, but they're just syntactically different. So this is a, this is a, um, well, let's just switch. So this is the, our query for donuts in XML format. If I just switch this to be JSON, I can see it looks different. So now this is same content, but a different structure. There are fewer angle brackets. It's less verbose. Um, and this is a format that if you are working in the web environment, you are most likely going to want to use. Because one of the nice things about JSON is it's compatible with JavaScript. So if I'm writing web app, I can pull in JSON and just work with it directly. Whereas with XML, it's a, a little bit more complicated. So again, these are both useful. They just are different use cases where people might want to use them. OK. So, um, so back to the API. So we can search for, gave an example of searching for, for donuts. We can also search just on, in a particular field within here. So I can, instead of searching the entire record, I can just search the title field. And so now there are 25 things that have donuts in the title, one of which is, um, about restoring wetlands and management of the hole in the donut, hole in the donut program, which is probably not, not necessarily what we're looking for when we're searching for donuts. Um, you can also, when you're dealing with an API, part of having an API is giving people access to large data sets, and there are a couple of different tools you can use to do that. One is, you know, very simply, you can page through the data. So just as if you look, if you do a query through a web interface, you can look at page one, page two, page three. You can do the same thing through the API. You just need to be explicit in how you do it. So for example, if I'm looking at, um, if I look at my first query here where I'm doing a search for things with donuts in the title, I can say, and limit equals 20, which means give me the first 20 records, not the first 10, which is the default, because I want to look at 20 at a time. Or I can say, you know, set the start equal to 20 and limit equal 20, which will give me records 21 to 40. So, um, these are, uh, you know, I guess the thing that, to take away here is that the we're using the query string to sort of set parameters on, on the query, and it lets you, um, you know, control what you get back. Another tool that 
you can use, and this is really you know, helpful in terms of exploring the data, is something called faceting. So faceting, um, the term faceting is not necessarily common, but you've all seen it before. If you take a look at Amazon, for example, and you do a search for donuts in the books, here we've got this, um, you know, they've got a series of books, and they've, they're grouped by category, and you get the different categories, and how many books in each category show up. So this is basically a facet. There are, you take all the books, the 1,800 books that match donuts at Amazon, 12 of them are in the breakfast category, 21 in pastry baking, and so on and so forth. So this is really a useful tool for exploring, um, you know, exploring the content within the library as well. So because you know, when you look at a facet, you can then, it gives you an idea of what subjects exist, like what types of subjects are most popular within your query set, and helps you, you know, drive off and explore. So we can, we can do the same thing. If we want to use the API and look at facets, we add another parameter to our friend the query string. So facets equals a comma separated list of what we want to facet on. So one of the facets might be subject, another might be language. And so if we run that query, we get, um, it looks pretty much the same here, but we've added to the end of the list a set of facets. So we have a facet called subject, and the United. So this is telling us that if I look at my 80 donut, resu donut result results from the donut query, 13 of them have the subject United States, three of the subject donuts, three of the subject of wetland restoration, which may be our hole in the donut, um, two of them Simpsons, and so on and so forth. So, and this this can be useful if you if you're. Um, looking for, a, if you want to narrow down your search, it can help you do that, especially if you have more than, say, 80 results. Similarly, we also ask for facets on language. So um, we have, if we look at our results, we see 76 of them are in English, four in French, two in Spanish, two, I think that's either undefined or unknown, Dutch and Latin. So you know, I think the Latin donut result, again, has nothing to do with baked goods, but there you go. So, so this is um, so this this is sort of showing you how you can pull the content back through from the API just through web browser, which is great, but it's not really what you would normally be using an API for. So, one example of how you could actually do this is I've written, uh, you know, a super small program, which again does my does my donut search and you know, selects a couple fields and displays them in a table. So and this is very much the same content that we just saw um, with, a few, with a few fields pulled out. So list of titles, the location of, the, um, of where the, what the um, book is about, the language, and so on and so forth. So how this actually happens, since we guess we have to look at some code, is what we have here is a simple HTML page which um, you know, displays the text, welcome to library cloud, and then displays a table of results. And there are obviously no results in the table when the page gets loaded. But what we're doing is, first of all, we are loading a library called jQuery, from, uh, um, which is basically a JavaScript library, which makes it um, very easy to manipulate JavaScript manipulate HTML and create web pages, um, you know, client side logic and web pages. So what we have here is jQuery has a method called get, which essentially will go to a URL, which in this case is this familiar looking URL, um, and will will then get the contents from that URL and then run a function on it. So we said go go to api.libre.harvard.edu, search for donuts, give us 20 records and then run this function, which, is, uh, which I've selected, um, passing it the data. And the data is the JSON that, um, that got returned from the API. And then we're saying, within that data, you know, within that data there's a field called item. And if I go take a look back at um, one of these result sets here, um, there's something called, well, it's called item. So that may be that, and what, it's going to, what it does is it goes through each item and then calls, this, calls another function on each item, 
And that function basically is taking the value of the item, which is, the value, which is essentially the individual record, and allows us to pull out the title, the coverage, and the language. So we're getting the, so we call a function on every item that we got back from the API. And if you just take a look at this piece right here, what we're doing is we're creating a string, which is essentially some HTML markup around a table with value.title, which is the title of the object, um, value.coverage is the coverage. And we're doing a check here to see if it's undefined and hiding if it says undefined because we're not really interested in that. And then the language. And then what we're doing is appending that to the table that is identified by this string here. And how jQuery works is what this is saying is look for the table with ID of results and add this text to it. So, um, and this is the table with ID of results. So what you end up with is this page here. And if I were to view source, um, well, the source is not actually updated when it happens. So you can see the actual results of the table here, though. So that's just a, you know, a simple example of you know, doing a very basic query against the API and displaying the information in some other form without doing anything too, too fancy. Now, another example is a different, um, is like a, an application written by David Weinberger as a, as a demo of this, which essentially shows you how you can mash up the um, results we're getting from the Library Cloud API with, say, Google Books. And the thinking here is that I can run a query against Google Books, a full text search, get some results back, find out which of those items actually exist in Hollis, and then give me links to Hollis being the, the library system, and then give me links back to those items. So if I search for, it's a dark, it was a dark and stormy night. Um, I get back a bunch of results from Google, and then one result, which is, um, you know, a wrinkle in time. And these are um, links to, these are links to books that exist within the Harvard Library System. So I guess the point here is not so much that this, this may or may not be the way that you want to search a library, but it is a completely different way that you know, was not available to you before. You, know, like you had no way of doing full text searches on books you know, that even were part of the Harvard Library System. So now this is a way that you, that you can do that, and you can display them in whatever, whatever format you want. Um, so this, so the, the point here is basically we're opening up um, new ways for people to work with the data. Another piece of Library Cloud um, is that it helps you, it helps expose some of the usage data that the library has. So, you know, if you go to the library and you're looking for books, you don't necessarily actually have an idea of, for all the items in a particular subject, what is the, what are, what are people in the community, whether it's defined as Harvard or the country or your class, people, like, what are they found most useful? And the library actually has a ton of information about what is most useful because if a lot of people are checking out a book, that tells you that tells you something. It's, it must have been some reason they want to check it out. A lot of people put on reserve. If a lot of it's on the reserve list for a lot of classes, that tells you something. If faculty members are checking it out a lot and undergraduates are not, that tells you something. Vice versa, that also tells you something. So, you know, it would be really interesting to put that information out there and let people use it to help them find, you know, find works within the library system. The flip side of this is there are some serious privacy concerns because, um, you know, one of the core tenants libraries, we're not going to be telling people what other people are reading. And even if you are um, showing, even if you're saying like this book was checked out four times within a particular month, that, you know, could be used to link back to a particular person um, you, you know, by de-anonymizing the data and finding out who checked it out. So, um, you know, the way that we can avoid, the way that we can try to extract some signal from all the information without infringing anybody's privacy concerns is essentially we look at 10 years of usage data. So it's over a long period of time and say, okay, let's see how many times this, this work was, this piece of, um, this work was used and by who over this period of time, and then basically give back a number, which we call a stack score, which basically represents how, you know, how much has been used. And that number 
you know, a lot of different calculations go into that number, but it, it's a very rough metric that gives you some idea of, you know, how the community, you know, may value that, that work. And so another sort of even more fleshed out um, um, application that takes advantage of this is something called Stack Life, which you may actually, which is actually available through the main Harvard library portal. So you go to library.harvard.edu, you'll see a number of different ways of searching the library, and one of them is called Stack Life. And this is, this is an application that, is a, that browses the, uh, the content of the library, but is completely built on top of um, these APIs. So there's no, there's no special stuff going on behind the scenes. There's no access to data that you don't have. It's, it's using the APIs to provide you a completely different browsing experience. So I search for Alice in Wonderland in this case. I get a result set that looks like this, which is pretty much, um, you know, it's very similar to another, any other search you might do, except that in this case we're ranking the items by stack score, which tells you, um, you know, which gives you some idea of how popular these items were within the community. And oddly, and so clearly Alice in Wonderland by Walt Disney is, um, you know, highly popular, but you can also see, you know, the top four here are, um, you know, uh, you know are, are ones you might not actually, um, are things that are highly used, but might, may, you may not have immediately connected with Alice in Wonderland. So our old friend, the annotated Alice is here. So I can take a look at it. And now what I'm looking at is basically a, a set of, um, I, I can have the annotated Alice right here. I have information about it. Um, and I also have a stack score of, in this case, 26. And this tells me sort of roughly how we got to this stack score. Like, who checked it out, like how many times it was checked out, like faculty, undergrads, how many copies the library has, and so on and so forth. Um, and you can also, interesting enough here, browse the stacks virtually. So the data here, it, this is showing you sort of a virtual representation of what the books like, might, what the shelf might look like. You would take all the library's holdings and put them together on one infinite shelf. And the nice thing is that we can, you know, first of all, the metadata about these books often tells you, tells you when it was published, it tells you how many pages it has, it might tell you the dimensions. So you can see that's reflected here in terms of the size of the books. And then we can use the stack score to highlight the books that are, have higher stack scores. So if it's darker, it means that presumably it is more, it is used more frequently. So in this case, I'm going to guess this is a version of Alice in Wonderland that is you know, very, you know, very commonly used and most access, the library has the most copies of. So if you're looking for Alice in Wonderland, this might be a good, a good place to start. Um, and then here you can also link out to, say, Amazon to purchase the book and so on and so forth. The point here, again, is not so much that this is the, you know, the best way to browse the library or, you know, the right um, tool for every occasion, but um, it's another way of doing it. And by making the data available through an API, which is made of very simple building blocks, which allows you to search the content, you can build something like this that will, um, you know, can be extra extraordinarily valuable to some people. So that's, um, so that's sort of, you know, as much as I want to say really about how the, a you know, what the API is and what it exposes. There's a there's a whole bunch of stuff behind the scenes, which I'm just going to touch on briefly just because it, it comes it sort of comes with this from a completely different angle in terms of like how does something like this get put into place. So an API is a very is a standard um, interface you know to all this content but to get it there you know the first thing we had to do was pull together um, information about books and images and the finding aids and the collection documents from various Harvard systems. Aleph, V and Oasis are the names of the systems and they essentially go into a pipeline of a processing pipeline. So first of all, we get export files from all these systems. We split them up into individual items. So we have um, you may have a file which is a gigabyte, which has a million records in it. So we split it up into individual items. Then we, for each item, we convert it into mods because some of these are natively mods, some of them are not. So we get them all to be in the same format. Then there are various enrichment steps where we add more information to the data than was available in, in the library. So we need to add, you know, first of all, we'd add what libraries hold it, 
We go through a step of calculating the stack score. We go through another step of saying, um, you know, adding more metadata in terms of what collections people might have added this, um, you know, people are creating collections of items. What collections does it belong to? How people tagged this content in the past? Then we filter it. You filter out any restricted records because, as I mentioned, there's some records that, because of copyright reason, we can't display. And then we load them into something called Solar, which is not a misspelling, but is the name of a search index, a piece of software that does search indexing, um, which drives all the search behind the API. And then it becomes available to the API, and people can people can use it. So this is, I mean, this is like a, f a fairly straightforward process. The, you know, one of the interesting things about it is that um, we are dealing with 13 million records, and we are going to be dealing, or or more, and we want to be able to handle these in a relatively um, um, speedy fashion. So we don't want it. It takes a long time to process 13 million records. So how this pipeline is set up is that you can. The, I guess the advantage of the, the pipeline, the problem that we're trying to solve here is that all of these, all the transformations, all these steps in this pipeline are um, separable. There's no dependency. If you're processing a record of about one book, there's no dependency in that between another book. So what we can do is basically, at each step in the pipeline, we put it into a queue in the cloud. It happens to be on Amazon Web Services. So there's a list of, say, 10,000 items that need to be normalized and converted to mods format. And we spin up as many servers as we want, maybe 10 servers. And each of those servers just sits there, looks in that queue, sees there's item to be processed, pulls it off the queue, processes it, and sticks it on the next queue. And so what that allows us to do is um, you know, apply essentially as much hardware as you want to this problem for a very short period of time to process the data as quickly as possible, um, which is something that only you know, now in, in the world of cloud computing you can provision servers you know, essentially instantaneously is that useful. So we don't have to have a giant server sitting around all the time to do the processing um, that might happen just once a week. So that is, um, you know, that is mostly it. There's documentation um, available for the Library Cloud Item API um, at this URL, which will be available later. Um, and please go take a look at it, see if there's anything if you have any ideas, play with it, fool around, and hopefully we can come up with something great. Thank you.